is good? All the time. And all the time? All the time. Let me try that again. God is good? All the time. And all the time? All the time. Yes, God really is. Psalm 100 verse 5. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. So we serve a good God. Even those who do not serve God, they are benefited by the fact that God is good. Because he maketh his son to rise on the... It's too early in the evening for our war to begin. For he maketh his son to rise on the... All right, I'll take it. Okay, it's the paraphrase. And sendeth rain on the... <laughs> uh, read Matthew 5, 43 sometime, 45. And see what the Bible says. He make, he make the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Let me tell you something. Every murderer who woke up this morning woke up because of the goodness of God. Amen. And God did not wake him up to kill somebody else. He woke him up to give him one more chance to do what? Repent. Amen. God didn't wake you up today so you can make more money. No. He woke you up today to give you another day to come closer to Him. Amen. 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 All life belongs to God. Psalm 36, 9, For with thee is the fountain of life. Understand me clearly. I believe in exercise and vitamin E and whatever else. But you and I are alive because of God. Amen. Where's pardon? Where, oh, pardon. <laughs> okay. All those visiting, may I see your right hand quickly? Right hand, right hand, this one. All visitors, right hand, right hand, stand up. Use your feet, stand up. Ah, it's so good to see you. You look nicer than the rest of us. Come on, the rest of us say amen. amen. We're happy you've come. May God bless you and may God use this single message to meet every one of your needs. Amen. Church, say amen again. Amen. You may be seated. May God bless you in your studies, give you school fees, use you to inspire others and make you a blessing to this nation. Amen. Who is from South Africa? May I see your right hand? Anyone? South Africa? No, not one South African. Let me come up a little uh, up to the West Coast. Namibia? No Namibians? No desert lovers? Okay. <laughs> Let me go up again. Uh, Angola? Let me come eastward. Botswana? No one from Botswana? No one from the Kalahari? Let's keep going. Anyone from Zimbabwe? <laughs> I'll take your show off hands down. All right. Anyone from, let's go all the way to the east, Mozambique? Uh, God bless you, Sister Mozambique. Okay, all right. Anyone from Lesotho? No? That country surrounded by South Africa? No? Anyone from Swaziland, the land of King Mswati? Uh, the man with 2,000 wives? No one from there? No one, no one, no one? Oh my. Let's go a little north. Anyone from Malawi? Ah, God bless you. I was in Malawi in September in a place called Zomba. Anyone from, what's next to Malawi? Zambia. No Zambians. You know, most of the, most of Victoria Falls is really in Zambia. <laughs> Do you know that? But you have done a remarkable job of marketing. The whole world thinks Victoria Falls is largely in Zimbabwe. Ah, uh, if we can only use that skill to market the gospel. Anyone from Tanzania? Anyone from Tanzania? Uganda? Kenya? Yes. Oh, Anyone from Rwanda? Burundi? Democratic Republic of the Congo? Ethiopia? No? Somalia? South Sudan? Sudan, no? <laughs> all Zimbabweans, all right. Well, I'm happy to see you wherever you're from. God loves all of us. Can you say amen? Amen. He is the God of, you know, when uh, in Genesis 14, when Abraham fought a battle to deliver Lot from captivity, 
Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God, Genesis 14. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. Amen. Psalm 24, verse 1, The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. Amen. So wherever you're from, this is my Father's world. Amen. Our subject for tonight, who is Jesus? You know, Acts 4 verse 12 says, Neither is there salvation in any, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There is none other name. Jesus Christ himself said with all modesty, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Finish the verse. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, as politically incorrect as that may be in this modern world, truth is very often politically incorrect. Jesus says, no one, and that no one is no one, can come to the Father but by me. Amen. Our subject is, who is Jesus? And why do you need him? Before I begin, do three little favors for me. Favor number one, please turn off all your cell phones. Some of you have two of them. Turn all of them off, please. You'll make me very comfortable. And I believe you know how to make a guest comfortable. Can you say amen? amen? All right. While you're turning the cell phones off, favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me. And all I want you to say is, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. And that's based on Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 9, which says, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. I want to speak God's words, not mine. And favor number three, I want you to think. Amen. Jeremiah, not Jeremiah, Isaiah 1, 18. Come now, let us reason together. Amen. Mark chapter 12, reading from verse 28. And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, he heard Jesus reasoning. Amen. The gospel of the Bible appeals to people who reason. Yes. Are you with me? Amen. That's why I'm glad we have so many university students. They should be the first people to accept truth. Because if you reason as you read God's word, you will reason your way right into God's arms. Yes. Let's bow our heads and pray. Holy Father in heaven, Lord, I ask you from my heart, help me. I am an earthen vessel, dear God, and if you don't help me, a lot of dirt will come out on the message. Because that's what I am. But if you help me, if you grant me your spirit in fulfillment of the promise of Jesus Christ in John 16, 13, how be it, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. If you activate that promise in me tonight, then the words I speak will be your words. Clean words. Please, God, use me for your glory, not for mine, and for the blessing of your people. Let the spirit working through me be the self-same spirit that touches every listening heart and that will convict those who listen to DVDs weeks from now. Thank you for the glorious privilege of preaching. I offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Let all God's people say amen, amen. and amen. Daniel chapter 3, reading from verse 13. Our subject is, who is Jesus? Daniel chapter 3, reading from verse 13. You're very familiar with the story of the three Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace because they refused to bow along with the rest of the crowd. Now it was brought to Nebuchadnezzar's attention that there were three Hebrew boys who refused to bow. Verse uh, 13 of Daniel 3 says, Then Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true? O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do ye not serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have made? Is it true? Let me pause on that. A lot of things should be true about this. Hmm? Amen. If the government says to you, is it true that you serve the Adventists follow health principles, what should you say? Yes. It's true. Amen. Is it true that you have a tithing system, what should we say? Yes. It is true. Is it true you believe in marriage before childbirth? What should we say? Yes. It's true. 
Is it true you observe the seventh day as a Sabbath? What should you say? Yes. And so Nebuchadnezzar said, is it true? And you've got to respect him for giving them a chance to defend themselves. Is it true? Some despots don't ask questions. They just take your head off. Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do ye not serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have made? Verse 15, now if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well. You see, it's good if you do that. But if ye worship not, <laughs> ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. Finish verse 6 to 15 for me. And who is that God huh? that shall deliver you out of my hands? And sometimes I entitle this message, Meet God. Hmm? Who is that God? Meet God. Our subject for tonight, who is Jesus? Because you need to understand, the God of the Old Testament is Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me say it again. The God who followed the Israelites, not followed, led them in the wilderness, was Christ. That same man who hanged them, that, who was hung, who was crucified on the cross. Amen. The God who destroyed the Israelite army in the, in the Red Sea was Christ. Amen. The God who sent the destroying angel and killed every firstborn human being and every firstborn animal in the land of Egypt was Christ, the same one on that cross. Amen. So when Nebuchadnezzar said, who is that God? He didn't know it. He was referring to Jesus Christ. Who is this God with the power to get you out of the hands of the most powerful man on earth? Amen. You see, earthly rulers with power, they like to throw their power around. And so when Jesus stood before Pilate in John 19, 11, the Bible says, Pilate said to him, uh, Speakest thou not unto me, verses 10 and 11, knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and I have power to release thee? That's intimidation. A lot of Christian leaders use it. A lot of spouses use it. A lot of professors use it. Intimidation. Speakest thou not unto me, Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and I have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Amen. You and I need to understand that what happens to you is not based on who runs the country, it is based on who you serve. Amen. When you understand that, you do what is right, and you leave the rest to God. Are you listening to me? Amen. Who is Jesus? To understand who Jesus is, let's go look at somebody else. Go with me to Luke chapter 1. Luke 1, we shall read from verse 10 of Luke 1. We're trying to answer the question, who is Jesus? It's already two minutes to seven. Time flies very quickly. I am supposed to finish at 7.30 for those of you visiting for the first time, but I'll go beyond 7.30. And if that interferes with your life, I'll ask the Lord to bless you. Amen. Don't worry. When Manchester United goes into overtime against Chelsea, you don't complain. Are you with me? <laughs> Am I speaking the truth? Yes. All right. When you sit down and watch back-to-back -back episodes of Generations, you don't complain about time. So don't bother me tonight. All right. What book did I say? Luke, what chapter? One, reading from verse 10. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of the incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. And the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Now the angel Gabriel came to inform Zacharias that his prayer, that his wife would have a child, was heard and answered. Amen. Now this is Gabriel speaking to Zacharias. But in verse 18, after Gabriel lays out the lifestyle for this boy, from verse 14 to 16, 17, in verse 18, Gabriel, uh, Zechariah said, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife, what? Well stricken in years. We're always bringing human arguments to God. Amen. Now, his argument was biologically valid. 
It was physiologically valid. As we say in the United States, he was over the hill. Oh, you understand. Huh? As far as reproducing was concerned. And so was his wife. And so from a secular, earthbound perspective, with no input from heaven, he had a point. But let me tell you something. We have a God who cannot be frustrated by circumstances. Amen. The Red Sea couldn't stop him. He parted it. Hmm? Yeah. Satan can't stop him. He threw him out. Amen. And sin shouldn't stop you or me. We have power to overcome. Can you say amen? And so Zechariah said, whereby shall I know this? Seeing I'm an old man and my wife, well stricken in years, the angel answering said unto him, verse 19, Luke 1, I am whom? Gabriel. That stand in the presence of God. Amen. Now, there's something called intimidation. There's also something called flashing your credentials. Amen. Are you with me? Uh, I have a PhD. I have a master's. How dare you question my contribution in a Sabbath school class? And so Gabriel said, I am Gabriel. Just talk of this way. Just something. The devil is doing his work. Don't worry. I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God. Amen. What Gabriel was saying, of all the angels in heaven, I occupy a position closest to God. Amen. Now, Gabriel struck Zacharias dumb and told him he won't speak until the child is born. Because when the angel closest to God brings you a message, which means he got it right from the mouth of God. Are you with me? And you doubt it. You're in trouble. And so Gabriel said in verse 20, Behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak. Because thou believest not my words. Are you with me? Yes. It is dangerous to doubt God's words. Amen. Doubt is suicidal behavior. So I go back to verse 19 of Luke 1. I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God. Amen. But before Gabriel, Gabriel occupied that position, there was another angel that occupied the same position. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 28. Reading from verse 12. Ezekiel 28, reading from verse 12, our subject is, Who is Jesus? We have to find out who Jesus is by taking a look at Gabriel and Lucifer. Ezekiel 28, verse 12, Thou sealest up the sun, this is about Lucifer, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, the diamond. The beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so, says God. Now who's the God speaking in Ezekiel? Jesus. Jesus. Understand me clearly. This is Christ. Now he wasn't called Christ then. But it is Christ. The God of the Old Testament now. And he says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. Who are the cherub that covereth? Go to Exodus 25. When God told Moses to build the ark, which was the first thing to be built, uh, when God informed him to build the whole tabernacle with the most holy, the holy, the outer court, all the furnishings, the very first thing God told Moses to make was the ark that contained the Ten Commandments. And in describing the architecture of this piece of furniture, in verse 21 of chapter 25 of Exodus, and thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And so the mercy seat was a, a covering for the ark. Now, listen to what God says in verse 22. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee. From above the mercy seat, read the next few words with me, from what? Between the cherubim which are upon the ark of the testimony. In other words, the mercy seat had at each end a cherub. Amen. You see? 
And the angels, they represented, of course, the involvement of the angels in the administration of the universe. Are you with me? God runs the universe using angels as his helpers. Now, the cover of the ark called the mercy seat was made of gold. The same piece of gold that made the cover also made the cherub. Ah, you missed that significance. The same piece of gold that made the cover also made the two cherubim. Telling us that they are closely involved in God's administration of the universe. They weren't made from a separate piece of gold, then attached. They were made from the same piece of gold that represents the throne of God. Now, in the days of Lucifer, apparently, there was only one such angel. Listen to Ezekiel 28, verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Anointed, I have handpicked you, says Christ. I made you and I handpicked you for the position of being right next to me closer than any angel that included Gabriel follow me closely as God put his words in my mouth now but we know Lucifer rebelled verse 15 in Ezekiel 28 thou was perfect in thy ways in the day that thou was created until iniquity was found in thee. Let's find some more biographical information about Lucifer. Let's go to Isaiah 14. We shall read verses 13 and 14. Isaiah 14, reading from verse 13 and 14. Our subject is, Who is Jesus? Isaiah 14, reading 13 and 14. Well, let's read 12 to make a connection. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which this week in the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. That's what Lucifer said. Somehow, self-exaltation was birthed in this angel. And the Bible does not explain how. There are two overriding mysteries in the Bible, the mystery of iniquity and the mystery of godliness. How could sin begin in a perfect environment? That's the mystery of iniquity. And how could a perfect God arrange a plan to save sinners? That's the mystery of of godliness. Verse 15 says, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the size of the pit. In other words, God says, I'm going to cast you out. Which he did. Revelation 12 verse 7 says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. That old, devil called the, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. Which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth. And his angels were cast out with him. So picking information from various books of the Bible. We learn there was an angel called Lucifer. Lucifer means light bearer, lux from the Latin light, pharaoh to bear, so you have a fairy that carries you across the lake. Are you with me? A carrier of light. And his light he got from Christ because he stood right next to Christ. He rebelled, wanted to take Christ's place. You can't do that. Christ must have pleaded with him. He wouldn't listen. There was a war. Christ threw him out. Verse 12 of Revelation 12 says, Therefore rejoice ye heavens, And he that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you. When God kicked him out, he chose the earth as his stomping ground. He knoweth that he hath but a short time. Now, follow me closely. It is evident from the Bible that when Lucifer, now Satan, was cast out, God replaced him with Gabriel. Amen. Because Gabriel said, I am the angel that stands in the very presence of God. Now, if you read the Bible carefully, Daniel Revelation, God always sent Gabriel on the most sensitive missions. So when he wanted to announce the birth of John the Baptist to prepare the way for Christ, he sent Gabriel. When he wanted to announce to a young girl she would be the mother of God, he sent Gabriel. Are you with me? When he wanted to explain to Daniel the mysteries of the the vision Daniel had seen in Daniel 7, he sent Gabriel. 
tells you clearly that Gabriel has an exalted position. And Gabriel himself said in Daniel 10, 21, but I will show unto thee what is noted in the scripture of truth. And there's none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael your prince. Amen. Gabriel says the only one that can hang with me in understanding these things is Michael. Amen. Who is God? Christ. Amen. So Gabriel gives us information of the position he occupies. Now, some angels are more powerful than others. You need to understand that clearly. Let me say it again. Some angels have more power than others. Let me reverse that. Some demons have more power than others to be demonic. Ah, you missed it. Amen. Listen to me. There are some demons that are so powerful that Satan assigns them to uh, people whom he sees are too close to Christ. Are you with me? Yeah. So if there's a preacher who's really powerful, the devil tells, demon, you go take care of him. I want to end it, a powerful demon. Let me explain what I mean. Luke 11, 24 to 26. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest. What's an unclean spirit? A demon. And finding none, he saith, I will return unto my house from whence I came. And when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. Are you with me? Amen. The Bible says some demons are more wicked than other demons. Now why is that? Because those demons at one point, who were they? They were holy angels. And angels have different degrees of power and authority. Now what that tells us, if you're reasoning with me, when those angels were cast out, they lost their position. What did they not lose? The power. Hear me carefully. That applies to Satan. Satan lost his position. But he left heaven with all his power. Now you must understand that to understand who Jesus is. Are you with me? Amen. I'm not talking about Satan because I love him. No. But I want you to see white is whitest when it's up against black. Am I right? Huh? To understand how tall a man is, put him next to a short man. Are you following me? You don't put Shaquille O'Neal next to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar to figure out who is tall. No, you put Kareem or Shaquille next to me. Then you realize this guy is tall. So now, to understand Jesus, I'm trying to talk about Satan. Then I'll bring, you to, I'll bring in Jesus at the right time. Satan was cast out, lost his position, but he left heaven with all his power. Now, in Daniel 10, in Daniel 9, Daniel is fasting three weeks. Because he has studied the prophecies of Jeremiah, and he realized that the time is coming when the Israelites must do what? Go back to Jerusalem. Because God said you'll be in activity 70 years. A decade, well, 70 years. All right. So Daniel now starts to pray. He's fasting three weeks. And he doesn't eat, doesn't drink, doesn't even shower. He's fasting. Now God sends Gabriel to answer Daniel's prayer. Amen. Are you with me? Yes. Now go with me to Daniel 10. We'll read from verse 12. Our subject is, who is Jesus? It is, ooh. 7.15. This should be a two-part message. But I may not see you again, so I have to give everything tonight. Do you have uh, Daniel 10 from verse 12? Then said he unto me, meaning Daniel is talking about the experience. Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard. When did God hear Daniel's prayer? The, how long did Daniel pray? Three weeks. Are you praying to God you haven't gotten the answer? Yes. Yes. Keep praying. Amen. This may explain why he hasn't answered. It's just maybe one reason. He said, thy word, were, and I am come for thy word. Verse 13 says, but the prince of the what? Kingdom of Persia, keep reading, withstood me, how long? One and twenty days. Now, wait a minute. Who is speaking? Gabriel. What is Gabriel's position? The highest angel in heaven. Now, who can withstand the highest angel in heaven for even one second? 
Who is this prince of the kingdom of Persia that held up the highest angel in heaven for 21 days? Now, this is where reasoning is essential. There's almost no court case that's won on absolute proof. They're arguing on the basis of what? Evidence. And evidence tends to point in a direction that you're following. That's being honest. Are you following me? Now, Gabriel said this person, referred to as the prince of the kingdom of Persia, withstood me one in 20 days. Now, let's take a look at what happens to human beings when they see an angel. Are you with me? Amen. Then we can determine, is this prince of the kingdom of Persia an angel, a, a human being or some other being? In Numbers 22, verse 31, Balaam is on a donkey going on a mission that he should not be going on. And the donkey stops. You know the story. And Balaam starts to talk to the donkey. The donkey talks back. And Balaam is not even aware the donkey is talking back. That's how people lose their minds when they get mad. Amen. Are you following me? Anger interferes with comprehension. Yeah. Now, the Bible says in verse 31 of Numbers 22, Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in his way, and his sword drawn in his hand, and he bowed on his head, finish the verse, and fell flat on his face. That's the reaction of a human being when he sees an angel. Let us go to Matthew chapter 28, reading from verse 1. Move quickly, please, because time is flying even more quickly than you are doing your search of the Bible. Matthew 28, reading from verse 1, the Bible says, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was an earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came, pulled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did what? And became as what? Who were the keepers? Soldiers. Now these are hardened men accustomed to killing people. When they saw one angel, they fell in a dead faint. Go to Luke chapter 2, reading from verse 8. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and there was so afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not. Now, who were these shepherds out at night? Remember, you remember uh, David killed a bear? Come on, talk to me. Yeah. Remember David killed a lion? Yeah. Remember Samson killed a, a lion? Remember he caught 300 foxes? Re there were bears and lions. There were wild animals in the land of Christ way back then. Yeah. Are you with me? Amen. So these men out at night were tough men. Hmm? They were willing to take on lions, hyenas, foxes, bears to defend the sheep. These are the men that when they saw an angel, their knees began to knock. And the angel had to say, it's okay. What am I saying? From Genesis to Revelation, whenever a human being sees an angel, the human being is terrified. Then we go back to Daniel chapter 10 verse 13. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. It could not have been the human king. Because there's no precedent in the Bible of a human being resisting the weakest angel. And we're talking about the most powerful angel. Now let me show you how intense the opposition was to Gabriel. Verse 13, Daniel 10. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. Now read with me if you have that passage. But lo, keep reading. Michael. Amen. One of the chief princes did what? Amen. Came to help me. Now, do you understand why I was emphasizing the power of Gabriel and Satan? Gabriel is the highest angel in heaven now. But it is obvious from Daniel 10, 12 and 13. He does not have enough power to overcome Satan. Amen. Amen. Now, I am not speaking badly about Gabriel. I look forward to seeing Gabriel in the kingdom. But listen to me carefully. Gabriel does not have the power of himself to overcome Satan. Here's how the power structure was in heaven before Lucifer was cast out. 
It was God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. This is the organizational flow chart. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, they're all equal. And I'll show you that before this series ends. Right under them was Lucifer. Are you with me? Amen. Right under them was Lucifer. Between Lucifer and God, there was no other level of authority. When you bypass Lucifer, where did you go? Straight to God. Let me say it again. You need to get this. Here's God, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Highest level of power. The second highest was Lucifer. He was thrown out. The second highest level now is Gabriel. Now he occupies that position. But the power Lucifer had, Gabriel did not get. He got the same position, but not the same power. But he is still the second highest under God. Now what I'm saying is, the angel in heaven, that's the greatest power next to God in heaven, cannot stand against Satan. What that means, follow me closely, that levels of power are this way. God, who's next? Satan. Satan. Then Gabriel. Listen to me. The second greatest power in the universe is the power of the devil. You need to know who you're up against. Some people think they can go study karate to deal with the devil. Mm -mm. The only power greater than Satan's power is God. Are you with me? Now, so Gabriel said the prince of the kingdom of Persia must have been Satan. Withstood me. One of 20 days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, now, huh, came to help me. Amen. Now, if Gabriel needed help with Satan, Amen. what about me? What about you with all respect? Gabriel confesses with no pride. Michael, one of the, the prince means a ruler. Chief princes could refer to Father, Son, Holy Ghost. So one of them came, meaning Christ, Michael, to help me in my struggle with whom? Satan. Now, who is Jesus? The only power that can help you with Satan. The only power. You see, if Jesus doesn't help you, the only hope you have with the devil is a draw. Come on, you're sleeping with your eyes open. The only hope you and I have is a draw, but no one gets into heaven on the basis of a draw. There must be a victory. Amen. Huh? And Gabriel said, I needed help. Michael came and helped me. Michael means who is like God. Michael came to help me. And if Gabriel needed help with the highest power under God, which is Satan, you and I need that help. Now, think with me again. Here is God. Next greatest power in the universe is Satan. Then Gabriel. Now, to defeat Satan, if he's the second greatest power, you've got to be what? Say it. Say it. Don't be afraid. Say it. You've got to be God. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. You've got to be God. Because the greatest power right under God is Satan, which means the only power that can defeat him is God. Amen. So that Jesus then finish it for me. Amen. Finish it. Jesus then must be God. Amen. Amen. I didn't say he's the father, but he's divine. He is as much God as the Father is God. Because only God can deal with Satan. Let me tell you something. When you give your life to Jesus, you give your life to the only power that can control the enemy of your soul. And that is Jesus Christ. That's why Satan tried to destroy him. Jesus came down. This same power, Christ, came down. Lived as a human being. He was God and man. Tremendous mystery. He was fully God, fully man. By the way, he understands everything you and I go through. Amen. 
No matter what your problem is, say, Jesus, you understand. You may not understand how he understands, but he understands. Amen. He lived, resisted every temptation of the devil. Yes. Then he died. <laughs> you know, there's some good people I admire. Hmm? They have admirable teachings. I admire some of the teachings of Buddha. Are you with me? Amen. Had some good teachings, I admire them. He died. Confucius had some good teachings which I admire. That's right. Hard work, yeah. you know, decency, good manners. He had those teachings. Millions followed him. He died. I admire some things about Mohammed. Prayer five times a day, give alms, you know, die, worship one God. Some things he said I admire. He died. Jesus came along just as human as Mohammed. There's some things he said, everything he said, I admire. He died. Buddha died, still dead. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. Huh? Amen. Confucius came along, he died, still dead. Amen. Muhammad came along, he died, still dead. Jesus came along, he died, and he rose. And so while I admire Confucius, I worship Jesus. While I admire Buddha, I worship Jesus. While I admire Muhammad, I worship Jesus. Because Jesus died and came back. If Muhammad could have come back, he would have come back. But he does not have power over death. If Buddha could have come back, he would have come back. He has no power over death. Death has power over him. But death is the greatest enemy. That's why death is the last enemy that shall be destroyed. Now Jesus submitted himself to death. There are two things, you know. You, it's one thing about being killed, another thing about giving up your life. You know, there are two different things. Someone shooting at you, you run, you get shot in the head, you die. There's nothing heroic about that. You are running. <laughs> but to stand up in front of a rifle and say, I am dying for what I believe, kill me. Now that's another story. You weren't killed, you gave up your life. Jesus laid down his life. He went into the territory of the greatest enemy. You see, the Bible says the devil it has the power of death, Hebrews 2.14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. Amen. The devil has the power of death. Death is the worst enemy God has to deal with. Satan went into the reign of death, went into the realm of death, into the realm of the power of Satan to demonstrate his power over Satan. And on the third day, Jesus came back from death. But let me tell you something else. The Bible says the father raised him. It says that several places. But you need to understand what that means. The father did not actually raise Christ. The father had told Christ when to get up. Amen. John 10, 16, 17. Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. And there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore doth the father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me. I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay down. Who can finish the verse? And I have power to do what? Take it up again. This commandment have I received of my father. The father said, son, I will tell you when to get up. But the power to get up is in you. Amen. Are you with me? Now here's why. We, if the father had raised Christ, we would be serving a God who needed help. Amen. Ah, you're not with me. You know, we would be serving a God who needed help, but Jesus needs no help. The Bible says, when he had by himself purged our sins. Are you with me? The Bible says there's salvation in Christ. Christ raised himself in his demonstration of his power over death. He raised himself. And only God can raise himself. Having died in humanity. He raised himself in his divinity. Why? Demonstrating that the greatest expression of power Satan has is death. And Jesus faced it and conquered it. Amen. Amen. By the way, that's the same power Christ uses in your life. Ephesians 1, 19, 20. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. The power that raised Christ from the dead. The power that Jesus used to 
reverse death is the same power he uses to break your addiction to drugs. Amen. And to sex. And to liquor. And your addiction to disobedience. Come on, say amen. amen. The worst form of, of addiction is addiction to disobedience. You show something from the Bible as clear as day, and people will not do it. Addicted to disobedience. And Jesus says, I have the power over death. Amen. I went into it, came back. I stayed three days so you can be convinced I was dead. You know, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, he says, I am he that liveth and was dead. Amen. Look what Jesus says. And I'm alive forevermore. Amen. Who is Jesus? He is God. Amen. Who is Jesus? The only one who can help you with Satan. Who is Jesus? The one who came to help Gabriel. Who is Jesus? The only power Satan cannot overcome. Amen. When you are in Christ, the devil can bother you. He can't overcome you. Amen. He bothered Christ. He bothered Abraham. He bothered, oh, he always, that's his work. But bothering is not the same thing as conquering. Amen. My brothers and sisters, who is Jesus? Jesus is the only power in the universe that can help you in your battle with sin. Amen. Because the power of sin is the power of Satan, which is the second greatest power in the universe. And the only power that can conquer that is the power of God Amen. who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. Who is leading your life? Is it Christ or Satan? Gabriel needed the help of Christ. Who are you? You think because you have a degree, you have a match for Satan? And because you're related to the president, you're a match for Satan? And because you can trace your descent from Lobengula, you're a match for Satan? No, 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 no. You better trace your descent to Christ. And I trace mine because he is the only hope. And so Nebuchadnezzar said, who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? The most powerful hands on earth, you see, Nebuchadnezzar, competing with the most powerful hands in the universe, God, Christ. And Christ had to show Nebuchadnezzar who he was. And Nebuchadnezzar said, did not be cast three men bound into the fire. But lo, I see four men loose. And the form of the fourth is like the son of God. Mm -hmm. He said, we put three, but I see four. Let me tell you something. When you are with Christ, you are never one. You're always two and three because Christ comes with angels. Who's running your life? Who? It's either Christ or Satan. Listen to me. The gospel is simple. The Bible is simple. 99% of it. I told you before, Daniel, Revelation, they have some challenging areas, but those could be understood if we study seriously. The Bible is overwhelmingly simple to those who in their hearts and souls want to know what's right. Who directs your life? In the Garden of Eden, God said, if you eat, you die. The devil said, if you eat, you live. <laughs> Which means Satan tells you, the way to be blessed is to sin. That's what he's saying. Yes. He packages sin so beautifully. And if you're a good advertiser, you know, it's not so much the quality of your product, it's the way you present it. Amen. So people eat snails, but it is packaged as escargot. Yeah. Are you following me? And they're eating snails, but don't call it snails. Put it on an expensive plate. And use a silver fork. And it don't, it, it, it's no longer a snail. This is a mushroom. Are you following me? You don't sell cigarettes in a black and white box. You sell a nice box. Nicely designed. And then you, you make a cigarette case out of gold. And you carry it in a suit pocket. And you drink wine in a specially made goblet. You just can't hold the glass like this. No, you hold it between these fingers. And you shake it around. Are you with me? Then you take a sip and you roll it around in your mouth. You're rolling around death in your mouth. You roll it around. And then you, oh, that's how you drink death. The devil packages these things. 
And so he told Adam and Eve, For God doth know that in the day ye thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. If you sin, you'll be God. And we believe that. Listen to me. There are two voices. What God says, what Satan says, you choose. Yes, amen. If Adam had chosen what God said, I wouldn't be here sweating. Are you with me? I'd be, you know, relaxing on table mountains. I'd be visiting Pluto. I'd be in heaven. Yes. Amen. Never the most. Yes. And so when God came down, he said to Adam, Genesis 3, verse 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy Listen to me. When you do what you do, whose voice is directing you? Hmm? Make a commitment before you leave this place. I want Christ as my Lord. You know what Lord means? You know what Savior means? A deliverer from sin. That's Savior. You know what Lord is? Someone who tells me how to live. Ah, you missed it. You see, most of us, we want Christ as Savior. Lord, I'm in quicksand, get me out. I have AIDS, cure me. My boyfriend beats me up, or my girlfriend beats me up, stop her. But when the Lord does it, then we say, thank you, Jesus, now leave me alone. Let me live my life. We don't want him as Lord. Are you following me? We want him as Savior, not Lord. But he's either both or he's none. Amen. Yes. My question to you is, I know you want him as Savior. No, no argument, no controversy, no fight. Is he Lord? Do you live your life based on what he says? I want you to keep coming every night. I don't care what exams you have. God will sharpen your mind. God will put the, tell the professor, set the exam only on the material you could study. Amen. As a reward for your presence in this meeting. Yes. But God will send an angel next to you and say, the angel, tell her what answer to check. Check B, check C, check A for Adventist, check <laughs> God knows how to come through. Come every night. Because God will give me messages for you. Amen. You need. And I need to be reminded myself. But for Amen. tonight, I want you to say, I want Christ as Lord. Amen. To tell me what to do. Yes. How many of you will say, Jesus, come to me as Lord. Direct my life. Tell me how to live. If you will say that, raise this right hand. Come on, raise it. Tell me how to live as Lord. Stand up. Because if Jesus doesn't lead your life, Satan is leading your life. There isn't a third choice. You know, in Matthew, not Matthew, Ezekiel 33, 11, listen to the words of God. You can hear his heart breaking. As I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Amen. But that the wicked turn from his ways. Yes. The verse goes on to say, turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, Amen. for why will he die? Yes. O house of Israel, why? Why persist in a life that takes you on a marble path to death? Deuteronomy 5.29, here God begging again, oh, that there was such a heart in them that it was fear me. I keep all my commandments always. Oh, that they had the heart. Oh, they gave me your words. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. Praise the Lord. But the heart is far from me. You and I are up against a power that can only be controlled by the power of God in the life of Christ. Amen. If Gabriel needed help, you and I need it critically. Yes. You stood to say, I want Christ as Lord. Christ will direct you in every area of your life. Amen. To do differently is to hurt yourself. Now and in the life to come. Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Loving Father in heaven, if I have preached badly, forgive me, dear God. Sometimes I get too excited. You take what I've done, this meager effort, Father, and apply it to everyone who listened. Father, I try to show 
that the greatest threat to us is the power of Satan. Not even Gabriel could withstand him. And my favorite author says, bear in mind, it is none but God that can hold an argument with Satan. My favorite author also says, the prince of the power of evil can only be held in check by the power of God. And so I pray that God, you give us divine common sense to stand on the side of Christ who conquered Satan, death, hell, sin, and the grave. And who offers to us that same conquering power to work in our lives. While every head is bowed, every eye is closed, I'm asking a very strange question. Many people go to church out of habit. Or they grew up in a so-called Christian home. But they have never consciously, willfully, of their own free will, given their lives to Christ. Listen to me carefully. If you have never consciously given your life to Christ by saying, Lord, I give you my life, lead me. If you've never consciously done that, you've just been all working on automatic pilot because you grew up in a Christian environment. And tonight you want to say, Jesus, I consciously, individually, personally give my life to you. If there's such a person, I want you to raise your right hand. You've never consciously given your life to Christ. You want to do it tonight? Raise your right hand. You've never done it. My brother, I see your hand. Come, come. I'm going to pray for you very specially. Come. Is there any other hand? Come, I come. Come, come, come. Don't be afraid. Come. Is that a hand? Come. I'm very serious. You have never consciously said, Lord, I give you my life. It's not something that happens automatically. You must consciously give your life to Christ. Come. Just stand right here. Let me pray for you. Can I have some cards to give to God's people, please? So I can take those cards and pray for them. You have never consciously said, Lord, I give you my life. Do it tonight, and you want to do it. Come. It takes a second like that for Jesus Christ to work a miracle in the heart. Amen. Anyone else? I have never consciously, of my own free will, with no influence from anyone, Given my life to Christ, I want to do that now. This conquering Christ, this power alone that can control Satan, I want you to come and make that commitment to Christ. We will pray you will leave this place as a child of God. Amen. You don't want a child of God because you go to church. You're a child of God because you give your life to him and you tell him to direct it. Anyone else? All the Pharisees were church members. They were not children of God. And so Jesus said, "Ye are of your father the devil. Satan has a lot of people in church. Don't be one of them. Anyone else? You have never consciously, of your own free will, said, Jesus, take my life and lead me. Come. I pray we go home. Anyone else? Don't ask what will people say. Let them say what they want. You ask the question, what will Jesus say if I don't do it? And who will benefit if I don't? It won't be God. You'll be saved. Come. Come and say, I consciously, of my own free will, give my life to the God who alone can conquer Satan. My brother, God bless you. Come. Someone else, before I pray, a quarter to seven or eight, I know that. But God can stretch time. Don't worry. I'll ask him to bless your studies. And he will. If you study hard, he'll do the rest. God bless you, my brother, come. Give this person a card, then I'll pray. We go, come back tomorrow. And the rest of you who've already given the life to Christ, this is not a spectator sport. You should be praying because there are people struggling. Don't look to see who came. Pray because Satan is doing his work. Let's outwork him. Anyone else? You came to church just because your parents brought you. Now you're convicted. You're old enough to decide, I am giving my life. You only need to be 20, you can be 12 and do it. Christ was 12, he knew what his business was. Anyone else? Just come. I pray and we go home. I give you 60 seconds. God bless my young brother. The younger you come, the better it is. When you come to Christ at 60 and 70, he has so much to dig out of you. When you come at 12, he has very little to change. The sooner the better. 
the sooner the better. And Satan knows that. That's why he gets the young people in all kinds of music, all dance, all sorts of stuff. He gets them. Because once he has them, he knows he has them for life most of the time. But come to Christ early. Let Christ have you for life. 30 seconds. I consciously, from my own heart, which has been touched, give my life to Christ as Savior and Lord. 15 seconds. Then we pray. Let me tell you how happy my heart is to see you. To see you. Heads bowed. If you're convicted while I'm praying, come during the prayer. You will not disturb the prayer. Loving Father in heaven. And now come back to finish the prayer. God, I can only speak for you. I cannot convict the heart. You can through your spirit. I'm asking you now very deliberately, personally and publicly. You said in 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any of these who came forward should perish, but that all of them should come to eternal life. Amen. Father, if you meant it when you wrote it, please stand by your word and give the spirit to these men, women, boys, and girls who came, that that spirit of Christ may strengthen them may support them, may sustain them in their battle against Satan. Mark them as yours by giving them your spirit, dear God, I pray. And for those who are struggling, dear Father, with this decision to consciously give the life to you, give them no rest until they make the most intelligent decision a man or woman can make, and that is to surrender to Christ. Give them no rest. Now, Father, take us home safely. Let the powerful angels escort us to all our homes. Defend us from the attacks of the enemy. Let the words we've heard remain in our minds and not be plucked away by idle conversation. Bring us back tomorrow, I pray, please. In Jesus' powerful name, let all God's people say, Amen, amen. and amen. amen. God bless you. God bless you. Do we have all the cards of all your names? God bless you from my heart. Come back tomorrow. God bless all of you. I love you. Come back tomorrow. Bring someone with you to listen to God's saving word.